We have already discussed or read about two ships that helped expand naval trade in the Indian Ocean, the Dow and the Junk, and today we are going to look at ships and technology that will be used during the Age of Exploration that allowed European countries to discover uh, new places for trade. The Caravel was developed in 1451 under the sponsorship of Henry the Navigator and would be based on existing fishing boats. It would become the preferred vessel for Portuguese explorers like Diaz, da Gama, and Magellan. They were agile and easier to navigate than earlier Mediterranean boats, and having a shallow keel, the Caravel could sail upriver in shallow coastal waters. The Caravel made the Portuguese and Spanish spice trade possible, but for it to be profitable, they would need a larger ship. As you can see on the screen, while there is some storage space in the Caravel, there's maybe not as much space as needed for the long journey. The Carac was a three or four masted ship developed in the 15th century by the Genoese that would be in use throughout all of Europe, although each region had their own specific design. Carac were ocean going ships that were large enough to be stable in heavy seas and roomy enough to carry provisions for long voyages. For example, the first successful navigation of the Cape of Africa that actually brought back spices would be in a Carac in 1498 and in its hold would be a hundred tons of spices for sale in Europe. Eventually a larger ship would be developed from ships like the Caravel and the Carac and it's going to be called the Galleon. The Galleon was a multi-deck ship built with a hull like the Caravel because of the expense of building a galleon, the ships were often funded by groups of wealthy businessmen who pooled their money, and thus they became at first primarily ships of trade, although if captured by enemy states, they would be put into military service. Because of the long periods often spent at sea and poor conditions on board, many of the crew often perished during the voyage. Therefore, advanced rigging systems were developed so that the vessel could be sailed home by an active sailing crew a fraction of the size aboard at departure. As you can see on the screen here, there is plenty of space for both the hold and for uh, cabins and passengers, but plenty of space doesn't actually mean that there is a lot of space. These would be very tight compartments, and in the case of diseases spreading, this would mean um, diseases went through a ship very rapidly. Improvement in ships alone would not bring about the age of exploration. Improvements in naval technology would also be needed. Prior to the age of exploration, the primary type of navigation was dead reckoning, and it will continue to be used throughout the age of exploration as well. A rum line is an arc crossing all meridians of longitude at the same angle, or in other words, a path with constant bearing as measured relative to true or magnetic north. As you can see on the screen here, the rum line is a straight line. And so this is what sailors would use when they would set out. So for instance, we're leaving from France and heading to the New World. They would just go straight at a relative angle and end up in their destination, assuming that you were able to keep track of your longitude. However, as you can see, if you take a great circle route, it's actually shorter. And so nowadays when ships sail or planes fly, they use the great circle route rather than just a rum line uh, as their method of well, traversing. Navigating by dead reckoning and by using the rum line would not have been able to be accomplished without the use of a magnetic compass which hopefully you remember was invented by the Chinese. The magnetic compass would let the navigator know where true north lay. If you weren't able to find true north, then your destinations uh, often could not be met. And this is why you have some interesting destinations when coming to the world. For instance, the quote unquote pilgrims we were supposed to arrive in Virginia and instead arrived in Massachusetts. 
An invention that greatly improved dead reckoning navigation would be the traverse board. It is a memory aid used to record the speeds and directions sailed during the watch, and even crew members who were illiterate could use the traverse board. The top part here is used for recording directions sailed. It has a representation of the compass rows with its 32 compass points, as you can see, um, just as on the face of the ship's compass. Now, each half hour during the watch, a crew member inserted a peg in the top part of the board, like here-ish. And the peg would be placed based on what was shown on the ship's compass. The innermost ring of the peg hole is used for the first half hour, and then each succeeding half hour moves outward until all eight rings were used, so a four-hour watch. Now, the bottom part is used for recording the speed of the ship. It has four rows of holes. Each column represents a certain speed measure in knots. Three more columns to the right give fractional knots, one-fourth, half, and three-fourths. Eight pegs are attached to this part of the board. Each hour during the watch, a crew member inserted a peg in the bottom of the board to represent the speed sailed during the hour. The speed would have been measured using a knot log. If the speed for the first hour of the watch was 10 and a half knots, the crew member would count over 10 holes in the first row and place one peg, and then place another peg in the column marked one half. In the second hour of the watch, the crew member would use the second row of pegs and so on until all four rows were used. At the end of the watch, the navigator collected the information in the logbook, cleared the pegs from the board, and used the information to figure out the vessel's dead reckoning track. Given that most people on a ship would have been illiterate, this is an ingenious method to keep track of information that is necessary to ensure you arrive where you need to go. The picture on the screen here is a traverse board from the replica of the Mayflower that you can see in Plymouth, Massachusetts. One of the oldest navigational tools will be the lead line, which in the age of exploration would be used to help determine positions at sea to ensure the ship stayed on course. No matter the composition of the line, it was always called a lead line, and at sea, the line would be marked with different colors of fabric, like here, to help determine depth in fathoms. The lead end at the end of the plummet, that, also we used to take soil deposits as it was hollow, as you can see. This could help a ship better estimate their position by providing information useful in pilotage, visual recognitions of landmarks, and anchoring. One of the hardest things to do on a ship was to tell time, so several tools would be developed to aid sailors in telling time. A nocturnal, which is on the left, is used to determine the local time based on the relative position of two or more stars in the night sky. Knowing the time is incredibly important on a ship because it's useful in calculating tides. And if you try and anchor when the tides are wrong, bad things will happen. Marine sand glasses on the right were very popular on board ships as they were the most dependable measurement of time while at sea. They were employed to measure the time at sea or on a given navigational course in repeated measures of small time increments, for example, 30 minutes. Used together with a log, smaller marine sand glasses were also used to measure the boat speed through the water in knots. Multiplying the ship's speed by the time the course had been kept gave travel distance. Eventually, another method of navigation, celestial navigation, would be developed, which did not replace dead reckoning navigation, but rather supplemented it. A quadrant is an instrument used to measure angles up to 90 degrees. When used by a navigator on board the ship, and you can see its use here, um, the navigator would sail north or south until the quadrant indicated he was at the destination's latitude, turn in that direction, and maintain a course of constant latitude. We've already discussed the astrolabe, and the astrolabe up to this point was not useful on board a ship uh, because it wasn't stable. So ultimately, the mariner's astrolabe will be developed, like you can see here. It was used to determine the latitude of the ship at sea by measuring the sun's altitude or the meridian altitude of a known star, like this. The backstaff is a navigational instrument that was used to measure the altitude of a celestial body. In particular, the sun or moon. When observing the sun, users kept the sun to their back, hence the name. They would be here. 
And observe the shadow cast by the upper vein on a, hor's, on a horizon vein. One of the ideas that sort of persists in discussing the age of exploration is that Christopher Columbus just randomly found his way to the Americas and had no clue what he was doing. That's not entirely true. When Christopher Columbus set sail, celestial navigation was just barely being developed, so he used dead reckoning. And the information they had on how to get to Asia was what he used for his dead reckoning. Uh, they were unaware at that point that there was a continent in the way, but otherwise, if there hadn't been, his dead reckoning maybe wouldn't have gotten him exactly where it would go, but would have gotten him closer. One of the reasons we think he was so bad at um, navigation is because he was the first sailor to keep really detailed records of his logs, and he exhibits when he tried celestial navigation. And uh, when he tried celestial navigation in the Americas, he was actually really bad at it. But again, that's just because it was so new, and he didn't quite understand how to use it. It wasn't sheer luck that got him to the Americas. They didn't just randomly go off and start sailing, okay? There was an intention behind what Columbus was doing, and given what he knew at the time, it seemed like a good idea. While all of these tools were used during the age of exploration, they're not the tools that we use nowadays when people are learning how to navigate. And yes, there are compasses that are digital and computers nowadays, but anyone who consistently goes out and sails, not just like sailing because you want for fun, has to still know how to navigate by the stars. Because if your equipment breaks in the middle of the ocean, well, you're still gonna have to figure out how to get where you need to go. So we're gonna look at some inventions that are developed out of a need that the age of exploration showed um, to sailors. A sextant is a doubly reflecting navigation instrument used to measure the angle between two visible objects. When we say doubly reflecting, that means there is a mirror here and a mirror here. The primary use of a sextant is to determine the angle between an astronomical object and the horizon for the purposes of celestial navigation. So, object, horizon. The determination of this angle, the altitude, is known as sighting, or shooting the object, or taking a sight. The angle and the time when it was measured can be used to calculate a position line on a nautical or aeronautical chart. Common use of the sextant includes sighting the sun at solar noon or Polaris at night, Polaris in the northern hemisphere only, to determine latitude. Sighting the height of a landmark can measure, uh, give a measurement of distance off and held horizontally. A sextant can measure angles between objects for a position on a chart. Additionally, a sextant can be used to measure the lunar distance between the moon and another celestial object, such as a star or planet, in order to determine Greenwich Mean Time and therefore be able to determine longitude. A marine chronometer is a timepiece that is precise and accurate enough to be used as a portable time standard, and therefore it can be used to determine longitude by means of celestial navigation. It's the final piece in um, achieving more reliable navigation. When first developed in the 18th century, it was a major technical achievement as accurate knowledge of time over a long sea voyage is necessary for navigation, lacking electronic or communication aids. In 1714, the British government offered a longitudinal prize for a method of determining longitude at sea. The awards ranged from 10,000 pounds to 20,000 pounds, or, in uh, monetary terms, you might understand, $2.8 to $5.6 million. And the range was, well, dependent upon accuracy. John Harrison, a Yorkshire carpenter, submitted a project in 1730, and in 1735 completed a clock based on a pair of counter-oscillating weighted beams connected by springs whose motion was not influenced by gravity or the motion of a ship. His first two sea pieces, H1 and H2, completed in 1741, used the system, but he realized that they had a fundamental sen sensitivities to centrifugal force, which meant they could never be accurate enough at sea. Construction of his third machine, designed uh, H3, in 1759 included novel circular balances and the invention of a bimetallic strip and caged roller bearings, inventions which are still widely used today. 
However, H3 circular balances still proved too inaccurate, and he eventually abandoned the long machines. Harrison solved the precision problems with his smaller H4 chronometer design in 1761. H4 looked much like a large 5-inch diameter pocket watch, as you can see on the screen. In 1761, Harrison submitted H4 for the 20,000-pound longitude prize. His design used a fast-beating balance wheel controlled by temperature-compensated spiral springs. These features remained in use until stable electronic oscillators allowed very accurate portable timepieces to be made at affordable cost. This, like I said, was the final piece in accurate celestial navigation, being able to tell time and thus calculate longitude. The last thing we're going to look at today is uh, navigational charts of the Americas. And just so you know, when you're talking about a map, but a map used for a ship, it is always a chart, not a map. Don't say map. Sailors will yell at you. Alrighty, well, this is an image of a chart made in 1490 uh, in a map shop in Lisbon depicting the known world. So, as you can tell, there's no Americas, and this is Africa. Uh, not quite accurate. And um, here you have some compass roses, right? And so then you see the, the lines that would be used when sailing. So this isn't exactly the map that Christopher Columbus would have used, but it is one similar. I'm sorry, chart he would have used. My brother will kill me that I keep saying map. Um, so you can see that it is rather uh, remarkable what Columbus did in a way, given that his charts, well, didn't even actually show where he was going. As a counter, this is a sailing chart of the Caribbean uh, nowadays. So you see the compass roses here, um, as well as other information about buoys and other sort of uh, landmarks to avoid. And this would be used in conjunction with a chart that looks like this, right? Which shows the depth of the ocean so you knew where it was safe to take a larger ship and where you need smaller ships. All of these types of charts will be successfully developed with naval technology. So what really should be remarkable about all of this is that these early explorations, they were done with dead reckoning, right? The Portuguese went around the coast of Africa using dead reckoning and not celestial navigation. So the technology developed is instrumental in the age of exploration occurring, but it's developing as the age of exploration is happening, right? They're seeing changes that have to be made and improving their technology. But those first few voyages, they were done with limited equipment, limited charts, and yet they still ended up finding, well, ultimately, places that would benefit their countries. And that is all we have today on naval technology.